This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And our guests this week are Sugar Vendil, director of the Nouveau Classical Project, and Trevor Gurekis, composer of Potential Energies, a new ballet that Nouveau Classical Project will be premiering at BAM in New York on May 29th. The New York Times has noted the group is leading the unlikely intersection of classical music and fashion. So we're certainly eager to hear more about that aspect of the project. But uh, Sugar and Trevor, welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you so us. Much. So uh, let's let's uh, oh, you're good. Uh, let's let's start with with what Patrick said, the intersection of classical music and fashion. That is not something we've done 160 of these shows before. That is not a sentence that we've ever said. Can you oh. explain to us? No, that's a great thing. Can you explain <laughs> to us what you mean by that intersection of of music and fashion? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, basically, I've always loved fashion, and I've always loved classical music, and um, I've always viewed fashion as this, um, you know, very this expressive art form. And uh, like uh, when I started the Nouveau Classical Project, I thought it would be really great to have a concert that had uh, music-inspired fashion and um, and still keep, you know, the integrity of a concert, whatever that means. So the fashion would be worn on the musicians and, you know, no models. I was really opposed to that. Um, I had gotten people who suggested models. I'm like, absolutely not. That's totally cheesy. <laughs> this is still a concert. And um, so that was just a jumping-off point. And I think, um, the as, you know, as years went on and I kept exploring what I could do with it, it just expanded into actually uh, figuring out how to keep rethinking, you know, what a concert is. And um, it seems at this point, potential energies is a culmination of that idea. So when you say fashion, um, you're talking about high fashion, right? You're not, you're not yeah. talking <laughs> about things that people are going to likely wear every day, right? Yeah, and what's not, <clears throat> and it's not, you know, people have different ideas of fashion. It can be really personal. F- personal for me, it's uh, the more avant-garde side of fashion. Um, you know, the more art-influenced side of fashion. Not fashion isn't, you know, short skirts and you know, wearing what's sex. It's not about that. It's not about being, uh, you know, appealing to men and or anything like that. Because that's something I think that's. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's a, it's a mis, uh, you know, it's a misinterpretation. It's a mi- misunderstanding or a <laughs> misconception? Misconception, that's the word, yes, um, of what fashion is. And that's not what it is to me. And that's not what we do. Yeah, and there's some great photos uh, people can see on your website. Uh, if, <laughs> if you're curious about, you know, what exactly we're talking about, this is, uh, this is, uh, very much uh, a, a collaboration between different uh, kinds of art and different kinds of artists. Um, so, tell me about the the fashion part of it. Are you how how involved are you in in creating these uh, in creating the clothes um, and creating the looks? Oh, for the every show. Um, yeah. Well, are you collaborating with other people, or are you developing these things yourself? Uh, we collaborate with other people um, because. I mean, I'm not a fashion designer. I've got a good eye and I can style things. Um, But what we'll do uh, is we'll oftentimes approach a designer that has a collection that really fits what we're doing. Um, Like what you showed with the Puro concert. It was Gemma Kong and I I was looking through her collection and it just fit really well. There were all these ruffles and there was this clown-like aspect to it. And then... um, I also worked with a friend and collaborator named Zan Chu and he helps um he helps uh direct the fashion element with me and unfortunately he moved to california but i learned a lot from him uh so we'll do that we'll style it because custom is extremely expensive but there are a lot of things that are out there um you know that you can work with it's sort of like when people have concerts um and they they you know curate music around an art show or something and you know the art's already there you don't need to commission something brand new just to have that um, but for the ballet, we are doing we are doing um, uh, clothing specifically made for the performance. So how does that 
impact the way audiences uh, interpret your performances? Are you bringing in uh, a fashion audience in addition to a classical music audience? Are you bringing in a different kind of audience than you could bring in um, with with a more traditional look or a more traditional performance style? I I think so, and I don't think it's just the fashion. I mean, that's there, but there are a lot of different elements. Um, of I think it's it has to do with. Let's see. I mean, we do get a new type of a different sort of audience. If you look through the photos of <clears throat> of just, you know, the post concert uh, like gatherings afterwards, like there are people in there that are not that are not in music. And um, I think it's the fashion, but it's also I don't know. I think it's our uh, I don't know, our energy or or it's, it's actually how we how do we choose to reach out to people. Um, you know, it's not enough to just throw fashion in a concert and think, you know, if you build it, they will come. It's not how it works. Uh, it's a lot of reaching out to specific people with specific networks and getting them to our concerts. And it's a lot of, I mean, I'll be really frank, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of legwork for me. I have to actually get out there and make some FaceTime and I enjoy it because I love meeting new people. Um, but it's not just sitting back and then like, oh, I'm going to put on this great thing and they're going to come. It doesn't work that way. Sugar, do you find that, um, and this is an idea that we've talked about on the show many times, of a way of like exposing something like a new music concert to new networks by involving them in some way. And uh, this to me seems like a perfect example. Like people who are into fashion tend to be more, uh, more likely to, to enjoy something like a new music experience. And this seems like a great way to get like potential audience members who are ready to embrace this thing. They just need to need the push. And knowing that there's some cool fashion element seems like a great way to build the kinds of audiences you're looking for. You know, people who are aesthetically interested in what you're doing and will spread the word. Have you found that you've made some like new music fans who are converted that you got in through the fashion angle? Uh, I think so. It's not, it's not, you know, I'd be lying if I was like, yeah, every single person becomes, you know, this advocate of new music. It, again, it's not how it works. It's not, it's a, this long game and of right. getting people back. But um, absolutely, there are people who have come back regularly and just, they're so interested. And it's, it's so funny because you'd never think that, that they would be. And where else would they find it? That's the other, that's the thing about it. It's, you know, we're inundated with so many things all the time, um, you know, with all these new things going on. And um, I feel like we provide this, uh, this sort of venue for them where they feel like they belong. And like, this is, you know, like this is within their reach. So, so I think that, um, that yeah, we've gotten some, some new uh, listeners for new music. So is your audience mostly music based? Uh, I mean, are they are they focused on music or I mean, would you say you get a lot of most of your audience from the, from the fashion side? I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say just the fashion side versus the music side. It's it's more like um, more like, you know, there's a music side and then the fashion and non music side. And I'd say it's pretty split right now um, from what I've seen. That's and, awesome. Which isn't bad, right? Because, I mean, it's, you know, we still want that music audience there, but it's really nice when there's a mix, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Well, similarly, I wonder, um, for instance, is there a fashion podcast being recorded right now where a designer is talking about how he or she got some exposure because they had stuff featured at this new music concert? Do you, do you know of any situation where designers have benefited from this? Um, well, I think... My friend Bo, who's designing the costumes for the ballet, um, she we had this little little concert a year ago, and um, she brought her tights. She's known for her tights, and people were buying them at the at the concert. That's um, merch. That's merch. <laughs> that's, that's nice. That's, that's nice. Magazines. So it's women in magazines. Yeah, her stuff is really great. Um, but we also, I mean, we, we haven't done this in a while, and I want to start doing this again, but we used to collaborate with uh, design. We've done it twice, two designer collaborations on our um, on our merch, you know? And that was mm -hmm. to get them, 
you know, to get them some, get an emerging designer, um, you know, some support in that way. Um, and yeah, get their work out. And, That's and, nice. And um, Trevor, I wonder about a situation like this where the potential for having lots of control over lots of elements is, you know, you could be downright Wagnerian in your amount of control considering you've got dancers and musicians who are going to dance and fashion that's being designed and everything. I'm wondering how much of a hand you had in the the full artistic scope of the project or are you just making the music or how's the collaboration work in that way? A pawn. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's definitely been a collaboration between the choreographer uh, Sugar and myself and um, and Sugar as director has been putting together all of the pieces in a broader sense. Uh, I tend to uh, sort of follow through with my job <laughs> as to like, you know, write a piece of music that does this. And so that's sort of what I do. And then, and then she kind of molds it into what needs to happen for, in the bigger picture of the ballet itself. Um, so I'm definitely not Wagner in, in this situation. <laughs> it, you know, I have to add, there's also just this element of trust because we've worked together for years. I'm not the micromanager type. I've asked, I'm not going to lie. I've asked him to like revise like little things here and no, there. I rewrote. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I asked him to rewrite a whole movie. All right. <laughs> so, but I'm not a micromanager and like, um, Basically, somebody's got to, you know, lay down the basic, what is, where is this going, this whole arc. Right. There, you know, about... There's an artistic vision. Yeah, so there's just, this movement is leading this and this and this. But there's we the, all, we all agree on... Yeah, what, we all agree on it. ...what we're trying to do. So if I'm not really achieving that with something that I wrote, then I'm totally cool with taking another look and kind of rethinking... And every time we've done that, uh, it's been better for it. So uh, I, I trust that the input that we get or that I get from uh, the choreographer and Sugar um, has been valuable uh, in guiding what I do. And, and we so. should mention the, the choreographer is Barbie Diewald? Uh, Diewald, yes. yeah. Diewald, Diewald. Okay. Um, so, so Trevor, musically speaking, what is Potential Energies? Uh, potential energies is the chamber work, um, which is uh, you know as the description might explain uh, collaboration between the existence of the dancers and the musicians on stage equally. Uh, the dancers have a relationship with the musicians sort of as a dream-like element. So compositionally. Uh, the, each dancer is tied to a specific um, musician, and I have to write music that allows that that room for the the choreography to you know manipulate the musician in a way that doesn't destroy what's being performed. So sometimes there, you know, I'll just write like a simple melody, and there's like a manipulation going on, and the melody can, can still sort of exist under this choreo choreographic is that the word? Um, mm -hmm. uh, element. So, uh, you know, that, that has informs a lot of uh, elements to the music. But there's also things that, there's moments where I take the lead and I write a piece of music that's like to be choreographed too. Um, so uh, it's a balancing act between what we all, what the story needs or what the ballet needs and what, um, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm supposed to do. So yeah. we said there, there's an overall arc that you kind of collaboratively agreed on. Um, could you maybe describe what, what that is? And then maybe we'll, we'll take a look at the trailer that you've put together. You want to? You want me to? Um, so the basic idea, as I did, was just sort of saying was, the, the pairing of the two elements. And what we wanted to do was to uh, come up with a non-narrative story uh, of sort of our generation um, and the relationship between the musician or the artist and this dream that surrounds them. And I think 
the story that a lot of people have is that you go to school, you're told you're going to be really successful, you go to the real world, you try your best, you dig in, you know, you're on Facebook, you're showing everyone you're doing everything, you're writing as much music as possible. And then there's a point where you, you know, you start to, to wonder if this is going to, you know, how is this going to work out? Is it going to work out? Do I have time to do this because I'm in New York and I have to have a day job to survive? Yeah, we all do. We yeah. all do. We'd be, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, we all, we all have our do. day jobs and it's the after hours that we have to write yeah. this huge work, you know? So I think that is a, is a kind of a, the arc of it that yeah. gets us like the self doubt beginning with this naive sensibility and then eventually by act three, it's organized in three acts. You become, you kind of question what you thought you were going to be, yeah. or, you know, and either you adapt and you figure out a way to continue or, uh, you know, some people stop. Yeah. I have friends that stop writing music and, you know, we know dancers that are not going to dance anymore. Yeah. And that's just part of reality for some people. And some people figure it out. Yeah. They, they figure out the balancing act that you have to do. But it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. I mean, There's multiple ways it could go, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that's like the big kind of story. And when we tie it to the like millennial generation, which is... You know, our generations. It's what it's we a, know. What we know. And that actually everyone in, in the ballet and every musician and dancer exactly. and us, we do this. This is like the story of what we actually do and the questions that we have for ourselves. Yeah. And I think everyone has this question. I mean, everyone has this, you know, this, this screenplay they never finished. And you don't need to be millennial to have experienced that wanting, you know? Yeah. That desire, like... Uh, just that, you know, like always looking behind you, like what, like did my life just pass me by? I mean, I know I'm not, you know, what, 60 yet, but it's just, it's something that I've, you know, encountered even talking to people um, who've been through life. And when I hear things like that, you know. Well, when you look at other people your age that are, you know, getting coverage in, in, the, in the times and that are, you know, going to, Europe or Asia and doing great things with huge orchestras or huge ballet companies or whatever in those places and you think well what what where did I go wrong that 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 they're doing that <laughs> yeah. and I've got a day job and especially you see it on your feed all the time you know mm -hmm. yeah oh, yeah I give away too much. I, I, I could talk about yeah. this ballet all day long I mean that's part of I mean it's totally part of the artist's life um, mm -hmm. yeah. I used to work for Philip Glass and he's told that story that he of course was you know driving a cab and doing plumbing all the while Einstein the Beach was at the Met and that's just <laughs> he didn't know that you could make a oh, living as a composer oh, well, like Einstein. he just that's what he said like I didn't realize you could actually do it yeah. and he's certainly doing it now so. sure. Sure. <laughs> it's a, yeah yeah well can you can you maybe for for the setting up to set up the the trailer that we have how is how is what you just described, how are we going to uh, experience that from this trailer? And actually, what parts of the of the work are in the trailer? Um, well, right with, in the trailer, we have um, Act One, the first third of it. And the beginning is just uh, the first movement. And it starts with an introduction of what this is, you know, the musician and dancer pairs. And then there's another movement that's in there. That um, that's a dance movement, and that's it embodies what it's like the drive, the you know mm -hmm. going for it. But it also connects with the individual. If there's like a solo, like a clarinet solo, mm -hmm. the the, music, the dancer that's related to the clarinetist will come out and be. So we're constantly reinforcing it. <coughs> we need to keep that um, cohesiveness. So uh, first introduction um, to show. The relationship between the pairs um second movement is about um i mean it shows this it's about this sort of drive and going for it and um there's always a relationship somehow between the sound and the the musician and the dancer and then the other movement um that's shown in the trailer is um the one with me and um my shadow and also with uh, my flutist and violinist and their their shadow that's all the same movement and it's about 
uh, resistance and resisting your own, um, you know, resisting your own dreams. I hate the word dreams, but I, what else are we going to say, right? Um, Inspiration. Inspiration. Um, so it's about that one's uh, has to do with uh, kind of getting in your own way. So. All right. And then so, shot oh, go ahead. Like, um, uh, or then just like a straight trailer. So. Sorry, what? Uh, I said it's shot like a like a film, like a you know like a short two minute film with uh, uh, the combination of these movements back and so forth. So there are cuts. So, yeah, yeah. Lots of different. In other yeah. words, don't look for continuity. It's a trailer. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. So okay. here, this is this is the trailer for potential energies. Um, this is uh, Trevor's and Sugar's music and performance and this choreography by who again? I want to credit the choreographer. R. B. D. Wald. All right. So here here is the trailer. Right, so that was music by our guest Trevor Gorekis, performed by Nouveau Classical Project, and choreography by Barbie Dewald. Thank you guys so much for sharing that with us, and we should say that if that sounded interesting to you, and you were going to be in the New York City area at the end of May, uh, people can go check that out. Uh, the premiere will be May 29th, is that right, at BAM? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Excellent. Yeah. So, that's, it's, it's, I, I love that you've got a, a trailer set up. Uh, so people can see what they're getting into. I feel like that's one of the things that um, causes the audience to be smaller for new work sometimes is that people aren't sure what they're getting into. And while that appeals to a lot of people, obviously that appeals to strange folks like us, but to a lot of other people, it can, I think, seem very uh, uh, challenging to, to put down a bunch of money to go see a thing that they have no idea what's going to happen. Right. right. When you go see a movie, that's a much smaller investment. You know, that's right. you know, twelve twelve dollars, fifteen dollars to go see a movie and then and you you've seen know all the trailers. exactly what the movie is about. I right. mean you may not know every little bit of it, <laughs> but you know so. enough of it that that you can decide whether you think it's the sort of thing that you would be into. And we don't get that with a new piece of music. So I think putting together a trailer is great. Um, so I wanted to and, capture some of the best moments, you know, the most interesting things. Um, yeah. At that point, because we hadn't finished it yet. <laughs> yeah, we were piecing it together. So there was much more to be shown now. But at the, when we did that, it was just sort of, this is what we have now. What's the coolest stuff that we can show that best describes the relationship um, that we're trying to show? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, and Sugar was earlier. She, this is my word, not hers. Was talking about the hustle of of getting getting every everything together for this group and getting the the as many people in and and how much hard work it is to put something like this together and then get people in to actually see the thing happen, um, which is an, an amazing. Uh, problem to solve is a huge problem to solve and it seems like you're solving it very successfully and these videos are a lot of work like putting together a, vi a video especially when it looks that slick that uh is is a non-trivial project and it's on top of actually putting a ballet together for the first time <laughs> yeah. right Seems so like that's an amazing challenge and but i do also think that is important to point out a potentially very valuable um piece of work to do uh are you planning to make more videos like this are you getting a good reception from this one yes we've gotten a really good reception from this and um you know we're lucky um you know with having really talented friends who you know always want to help um so that's how we made it happen but i think that uh yeah i really after this i'm I'm trying to figure out how to bring in a more, I don't know, do more videos uh, for NCP because I think it's, I think it's essential. I mean, especially if you do music. Well, um, I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, people watch music now more than ever. So mm -hmm. uh, doing like a slick trailer that's almost like a music video uh, is something that's more familiar to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it, it, go ahead. Are, yeah, I mean, you can kind of get this pieces of this and that and kind of get a, an idea of what the tone will be, like the brighter parts, the darker parts. You know, you get kind of the spectrum of what we're trying to do. And it's the best way to do it instead of just putting a sound clip, which people will listen to for like 10 seconds. Or not at all. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. and, and it's, I think, especially important for a project like this, like, Nouveau Classical that's that's using so much visual stuff on top of the sounds that it has a, even more value to a group like this and a performance like this than it would for most groups. But even even without these these extra layers that you're adding, um, the the kind of visual richness that's that's somewhat unique to Nouveau Classical project and Potential Energies in particular, <laughs> that this is the sort of thing that a lot of uh, even more traditionally performed music could really benefit from. When you look at MTV is obviously not showing music videos anymore, but <laughs> even in pop pop music, when you look at the top channels on YouTube, the, a lot of them are Vivo channels and yeah. and music video channels. That's where that's where people are going to listen to music. It's one of the first places when I hear about a new piece of music that's been premiered somewhere especially a new yeah. piece that's been premiered but hasn't gotten um a, a recording yet i will always go to youtube to see if somebody has a video recorded performance on youtube to see what it looks and sounds like and, and, and go ahead how Sam. ubiquitous that is is that you depend on it for that and i depend on it like if i type in you know uh, Beethoven piano sonata, sonata number whatever, and I can't find a scrolling score version of it on YouTube. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, because there are so many of them available. It's 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 just ubiquity. You're coming to expect it to be there when you go to YouTube, and yeah. and it's amazing. Even if I play a song, if I play a piece for the class, even if it's a static image, they'll sit there like this. <laughs> yeah. And while they're listening, you know, they're staring at that picture of a, you know, a sunset or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't, you know, I think some people would are like have a fear that you're not then what about the music, right? It's really just an invitation, you know, and you like with our with our concerts, everyone talks about the music after a, a lot they're like what was that piece again because they know they're at a concert they know it's you know it's music so i think that uh visual element just it's just um yeah like an invitation and then you know you keep listening you keep listening you know it's, it takes more than one listen to get into something and um that that visual element just makes it more likely for you to get um get people to listen so there are a lot of different ways that we could get people to listen. And uh, <laughs> Sam, 
brought one to our attention, and I will uh, let him explain it. Um, okay. Is it the twerking? Classical. No, 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 no. No, twerking <laughs> classical music sounds great, though. We should get. We need more of that. I think oh, that's oh, right. definitely that was the Dvorak Nine thing. That's definitely going to help l uh. legitimize what we do. <laughs> um, but this may even go further than that. Uh, we we have all always enjoyed the uh, stereotypes of classical <laughs> music being enjoyed with a nice uh, brandy or you know some kind of wine, which are of course lovely, but. A bit stereotypical, uh, where you have to, you, you know, you, we're, we're all wearing our elbow length gloves when we go to the lobby to order our, 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 uh, exactly right, right, our Chateau Neuf de Pop, um, four, our four bottle, four dollar bottled water, or in New York, probably four dollar bottles of water, uh, seven, well, you gotta do it movie theater style at the opera, you gotta yeah. sneak a brownie in your purse, yeah, there you go. Right. Well, speaking of sneaking brownies in, hey, -o. oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Colorado Symphony, That's and I, show. I swear this yeah. is not from The Onion. I'm looking at the Colorado Symphony's webpage. They're doing a series called Classically Cannabis, the High Note series. Sorry. As you know, Colorado... See what they did there with the high thing? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're very clever. <laughs> Colorado and Washington <laughs> recently uh, decriminalized... Uh, marijuana for recreational use, as you know, or you should know. And so now they're offering a concert. That they're not saying what the program is yet, but they're going to have a hosted bar hors d'oeuvres, of course. <laughs> well, no, you got to bring your own. Munchies. Yeah. It's it's bring your own. Much. Right. Yeah. You um, and a performance, performance by the Colorado Symphony is all it says so far. But it's being it's being curated, it says. So that, to me, suggests that the person who's footing the bill is going to have some say in what the program is. Um, curated well, it's by, presented by presented by Ideal 420 Soil. <laughs> That's so awesome. This is getting this is getting better by the minute. Yeah. Tell me more. Well. I would just like to say this, this is all funny and everything. I think, well, you know, I think that's a wise thing to do for the Colorado Symphony because it's legal there and they might as well embrace it. And just as an editorial statement, going to a classical concert and getting baked and watching it sounds like absolute blast. Mm -hmm. And if I could do it, I would do it. If I lived in Colorado, I would go to that concert without doubt. <laughs> yeah, And it seems like everyone will be really fun. <laughs> Right. Or or mellow. Yeah. <laughs> Just mellow. I mean, it's I, I, I think it's with one of these things that we're trying because we've been told that classical music is either it's already dead or it's dying or orchestras are dying or the audience is dying or the audience is old or the audience doesn't like new things. And so this is hopefully it feels a little bit like grasping at straws. But I no oh, man, it's there's a huge culture. I'm okay with it. That, no, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not averse to it at all. There's a huge culture in the state, and now that it's been legitimized, that culture wants to come out of the closet. You know, um, people aren't don't feel shame over the fact that they go and drink a glass of Merlot at a symphony concert. You know, um, it's legal there, and I think this is a great thing to do. We should say though, you're not going to be smoking in the hall you're not going to be smoking at the at the place itself right it's an outdoor concert right? i don't know right they they, they've got they, no, i think oh really it's a, a, a if not gallery. they kind of missed something there hello do an outdoor concert i think they've got like a space <laughs> like set aside summer. for it right um oh a space set aside for it yeah i think it's uh i think it's outdoor it's would be great idea. though yeah, yeah. From a practical point of view, embracing a culture in Colorado that when they come to the concert, <laughs> their brain is going to be affected in such a way that when they hear sounds, they're more likely to go, that was awesome. <laughs> I mean, how better to get new audience than right. that? You know? Yeah, right. they'll go to the next concert and they'll be like, this isn't as good. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll be fine. I think I think it's one, it's, it's a cool way, again, to get um, to... To get people to, you know, come to a concert, singular, right. a mm -hmm. concert. Let's see if so they, how do you that. That is an interesting point, is that a lot of these these bring, like, get new people into the show things yeah. are great for one show. Yeah. Um, and, and and that's something we should we should talk about more when these things come up because they come up all the time, right? Every every 
couple of weeks, we see a new gimmick is maybe not the right word, but a new, a new gambit to get people into the hall, right. to get new people <laughs> that are culturally interested. What is the, what is the phrase people use? Culturally, culturally aware, non-attender, something like that. The, 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 the to get the culturally aware, non-attender to show up and That's, they'll do the one thing, but what is the, 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 the what are you going to do when you have them there to convince them that outside of whatever the gimmick was for tonight's show or this week's show, what is the gimmick that will get the, or what is the thing that will get them past the gimmick and interested in a long-term, a, a long-term relationship with the music that they've come to see? I think a lot of it has to do with the identity, to be honest. I mean, look, we're, we're still small growing, whatever. So, you know, I mean, it's not like I have, you know, uh, I'm not like, we're not like Nicola Benedetti with like a million people at our concerts, but we do have a regular audience and we do pretty well. Like the, um, we don't, we don't ever, we don't really have, you know, pathetic numbers of um, audience turnouts usually, but I think it has to do with an identity. You know, there are so many classical groups out there, right? And there's so many symphonies, there's so many orchestras, operas, whatever, but like there's no distinct identity between the two. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's for a number of reasons that um, are kind of out of their hands. Like, for example, when you're in a small ensemble, it's just those people. And there's, they, you know, this thing is something that they love and that they want to see go this way with like an orchestra. They've got this, you know, group of people. They're all a bunch of hired hands, right? Right. And who's really, you know, I mean, and then there's a conductor, of course. So, like, you, you know, it's like, who who are they? Like, who are you supposed to, like, I don't know, love out of that big mess of people, right? Right. I guess, I, I guess it's the conductor. Well, but I guess No, I think you're absolutely right. You're developing a, a relationship with a, with a person, with a personality. And maybe that's the thing that the Colorado Symphony is doing here is they're giving the orchestra a bit of a personality, <laughs> which is very easy to lose in something as monolithic as, as an orchestra or an opera company. And, and I think you're absolutely right that well, this is one thing that chamber music does much better than large ensemble music is that it gives a personality. And, you know, we can say, you know, I really dig the stuff that Nouveau Classical is doing. I really dig the stuff that Ethel is doing. I dig the stuff that Kronos is doing or, or Eighth Blackbird or whoever it is that, that they have a, there is a, to use the colloquialism, a, there's a vibe about Eighth Blackbird and it's different than mm-hmm. the vibe about other Pierrot like ensembles. And there's well, a vibe about Nouveau Classical and it's different than the vibe around other mixed chamber ensembles. Um, and it's natural. It, it's natural for an orchestra to have less character because it's built of people who are, get the job learning how to do things the standard way. They go in an audition and demonstrate that they know the standard way to play all these excerpts. Yeah. Like that's what it's, that's the building block of putting that ensemble together. So orchestras is, is a lack say, of personality. Right. And, and orchestras can say they have lots of character one to the other and they do in their own way, but the orchestra is way more beholden to an artifact sound that they've got to create. And a chamber ensemble is making their sound, whatever that sound is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just like, I think it's, I'm sure they're aware of it. You know, the symphonies, like, I'm sure they know what they're doing most of the time. But for example, with this uh, Colorado Symphony thing, it's like, okay, great. So you're doing this one-off kind of thing, or maybe it'll happen again. But how do you embody that, you know, forever? Like, you know, because then if it's just that, that's when something becomes sort of a gimmick is, I'm not saying that, I don't think gimmicks are always bad. I mean, Me I don't, either. I think I don't gimmicks think are fun. But I'm just saying, like, that's when it um, it doesn't really work like you want it to. You'll get people to the one thing, but it's like, so how does that carry on to the next thing and the next thing? That, that's the, the marketing element that I think is important, That uh, which is a dirty word in classical music <laughs> and high mm-hmm. art. But, I mean, just look at uh, the Met, and the, they're so successful because they make great, beautiful Post, you know, yeah, it's really like, stunning. They show yeah. they have this taste, you know, and when you go there, like, this is what you're going to get. And you're like, I don't want to be They get that. famous people to yeah. go to the open. Right, the audience, they, they want to be a part of that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, and when you when you see those posters, a lot of them focus on people, like individual people. Right. Mm-hmm. There's the soloist that like when they when they're plugging Siegfried, there's a 
photograph of the dude who's going to sing Siegfried. Mm-hmm. And and w- when you look at the really successful orchestras, their marketing is all built around a photograph of Gustavo Dudamel or Michael Tilson Thomas. Well, a lot um, of the a lot of the orchestras and opera companies did I mean it's been this way for a long time is that they their identity is built on their higher ups and the guest soloists they have to come. If Gil yep. Shaham is going to be the violinist with But like Gil, the, Gil Shaham know. moving around is one show, but the long-term identity is based around people that live there that that, that is their their weekly yeah, month I mean, to month year to year gig. Of course. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. All of all what's, San Francisco's marketing that? Materials That's are MTT and go, go ahead, system. Sugar. Oh well, I was just gonna say what. So yeah, it. That's true, and that's how it should be. Like, this is the director of this symphony. You know, this is the musical director, the conductor, whatever. But it's like, so who are they again? Like, who is that? Right. Like, I don't know you. you I know, think that's your classical person. Yeah. That, for marketing purposes, it makes lots of sense to do that, but it pushes the rank and file and the concerns of the rank and file who really get everything done in that situation to the background. And speaking of Met, the Met, the, Met Deo, the rank and file with the Met, meaning union uh, musicians and, and workers stage of hands. all kinds. And stage, stage hands, hands is a big people, part of this. All people involved in getting the job done at the Met. Um, Peter Geld gave an interview. Uh, it was earlier this week or a week ago or so talking about the labor issues going on at the Met right now. And uh, it's not too long, but luckily for us, friend of the show, Drew McManus, um, give us, gives us the cliff notes on what's actually going on. The big thing is is that Peter Gill makes it clear in his mind all the financial problems are have to do with union musicians making too much money. Huh. Right. <laughs> That's basically his thing. It isn't due to mismanagement. These are the bullet points he makes. It isn't due to mismanagement. Um, it's due mostly to a cultural rejection of of opera as an art form. Yeah. The donors yeah, he said have suffered that in that German too publication. Much, and union employees have overly generous benefit programs and particular pensions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there there have been several interviews recently with Gelb where he's got this very defeatist streak uh, in describing the status of of opera in general and the uh, and the Met in particular that people just people just don't want to see this stuff. Well, that strikes We're me as a management them. problem. Yeah, right? yeah if, like why, if you think if it's gonna that be is right if, here. He, he's <laughs> he's saying it's not a, it's not my fault that people don't like my thing. Well, you need to either need to change the thing or convince them what's so great about it. Like, that is your job. But at the same time, like, I don't know what their issues are, but it's all relative. It's like, if you're not bringing in the income, you know, how are they supposed to meet, like, make this budget of, you know, line item, whatever musicians get paid this much? Like, I, like, I can sort of see what he's saying. Like, ticket sales are really important, you know, like, you I mean, and it sucks. I mean, you can't just, obviously musicians shouldn't be working off a commission off ticket sales. And I mean, that's how a lot of our, when you're a small ensemble, you split what you can make from the ticket sales, right? right and that's right. not how, it, I'm not, you know, an opera shouldn't be run that way, but it's it's all relative. Um, you know, if the if a company's not making enough money, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, Yon- Jonas Kaufman is not coming in to sing for a split of the gate. Right. right. <laughs> well, see, Though that would be that- awesome. And I would go to that show. To, to yeah. me, that brings up the point, is it, is Peter Gilb telling the truth, absolute truth? In that case, then, his point has more validity, but I think the argument from the musician's point of view would be that he's not being forthcoming in that they're bleeding money in other ways it doesn't have to do, which is why people should have gotten, gone to Kickstarter and backed for the show Drew McManus's 990 project. Um, yeah, well, you, you just have to handle the ones that are a couple of years old now if you go to, like, GuideStar. Right. Um, what was I going to say? You know, one of the most revealing things I, I thought was interesting from that interview, and actually come out a while, I mean, it's been it's been known, or it is known. Well, he's been given um, these interviews the, for a while. Well, right, but I, is that I put, I put Met the story Singers? Of Drew's assessment of it. Met, Met Singers not the soloists they hire for, for these gigs. Met singers make 200 grand a year, yes, which is great. That's amazing. Um, well, and the stagehands are making millions <laughs> a year. 
Yeah. I don't know what the stagehands make. No, I know. I, I mean, the Carnegie stagehands do very well. Yeah, I think they're in the league with Carnegie. I think so. What I'm, it? I want to be a stagehand. I don't want to do piano anymore. Yeah, let's anymore. just all quit. <laughs> what am I doing? What? Yeah, I don't know. I think you have to know somebody to get those gigs. It's like it's like getting a job at the Port Authority, I think. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think we can say that the the cue, the, the, the pedal timpani roll in the overture to the labor battle that's going to happen between the Met... And yeah, this is this this is all just foreshadowing for it's hard to a crazy it's fall crazy. season at, at 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 the Metropolitan Opera. So, yeah, yeah. or, or a crazy not fall season at, we'll see. at the Metropolitan we'll see Opera. Happens. We'll see. Yeah. Very, very briefly, just mention that uh, in the vein of big arts organizations having trouble, San Diego is, as you know, had a thing where. There was a controversy recently where they were having lots of financial trouble, and everybody said it was because of this one guy who'd been there forever, and then a bunch of people from the board left, and they were kind of in disarray. They've taken some quick action to stop the bleeding and get things back on track. So uh, I think that's going to be another situation where we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Um, so anyway. Well, Last? I mean, you, oh, go ahead. That he's – Kind of stupid battles going on mm -hmm. that are so distracting. I mean that. So that's the the image of classical music: orchestras fighting, orchestra musicians fighting in the orchestra. That's not cool. I don't want to go to that show. Right. <laughs> well, that's old news, though. It is old news. I posed the question and on it, one show probably a year ago or more that like it, in the idea that uh, any news or any advertising is good advertising. Like classical music is in the news a lot because they're. Musicians are striking all over the place, you know. Right. Yeah. People, are, people, people are talking about classical music all of a sudden in like even on, politicians, in, in business magazines, and politicians. Yeah. I don't know. It's really it's really it's like Fox it. News, like entitled <laughs> orchestra players are like taking down this country or something. Right. Yeah. All I know, all I'm I sure know that's is already that been it's, there. Uh, it's Obama's fault. <laughs> Did yeah, you know, thanks Obama. <laughs> yeah, thanks Obama. Fox News found that most 90% of orchestra musicians have heating and air conditioning. They own a refrigerator. They have a car. <laughs> and instruments <laughs> worth millions of dollars. They have instruments. They pay to get them worked on. Anyway. It's just out of control. <laughs> and, and you know what? They didn't even build those instruments themselves. That's right. They got them. Right. Those handouts. Um, <laughs> you know, be perfect right now if we didn't have draconian copyright law in this country. What? You know what would be perfect right now if we didn't have draconian copyright law? I don't know. To sing happy birthday to new music oh box. Oh my god, I know, right? <laughs> new music box. We should sing the, 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 dumb, the dumb restaurant happy birthday. Happy, I happy believe birthday. <laughs> That thing. I, I believe Happy Birthday is going through a. Um, it's still in a in some kind of. Yeah, legal there's a person right that's uh, trying to do a documentary about it, and she's suing Warner Chapel, who who who's the, yeah. the group that claims to own the copyright on it. Um, but anyway, you were saying, Sam, why would we be singing Happy Birthday? Because they turned 15 at some point, sometime. New, new Music Box is 15 <laughs> years old this week. Yeah, our, our favorite new music magazine, and and our our uh, our, our our older our older more more established and, and much better written cousins, uh, right. New Music Box. So I have an um, article coming out next week. You do? Um, yeah. Nice. Excellent. Yeah, About uh, what you're doing with Nouveau Classical. Um, a little. I mean, there's yeah. I tell a little of that story, but mostly to just talk about the idea of of challenging the status quo, whatever that means. But yeah. Cool. My article won't nice. sound like that. I worked really hard on it. I don't sound like that when I write. <laughs> okay. I well, nice. we'll look forward to I'll, it. I'll try to think about air quotes when I read it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many. They edited a lot of those quotes. <laughs> we, we talked uh, a lot serious, about history. Of music. Right, right. We I'll ask Molly how many, how many there were. <laughs> we talked a lot about the history of me music box when we had uh, – well, one of the, do we have we had Frank on twice? We've had Frank on at least once, maybe twice. Yeah. Okay. Times. Well, anyway, when he was on, we talked about the beginnings of the, of the uh, the endeavor. And if you want to laugh, go to the Wayback Machine and look at the first incarnation of the New Music Box website. It's pretty funny. It's good. Well, I should I should <laughs> find that. Um, it's like the embarrassing middle school picture for New Music Box. 
That would have been a great April Fool's, just like change the whole website back to the yeah. <laughs> Make it the, the you know, right. 1990s it's Web nice. 1.0 design. Right. Well, and 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 they've done some really great stuff. Uh, Frank's got a nice um, kind of retrospective on on New Music Box up, and so does Molly. I don't know uh, if Alex has one as well, um, but you you should definitely check them out because they've done some really great work. And and I, I commented on this uh, on their um, on their site. Uh, or on their Facebook page or something, but they they were kind of asking for people's favorite moments of of their past, and one of my favorites, and we may have talked about this on the show before, but they did a a, a really great uh, profile. Frank did a really great profile of Milton Babbitt before he passed away. That has mm-hmm. some just really fantastic video of uh, Milton Babbitt and uh talking about all kinds of things talking about music but then also talking about baseball and talking about craft beer and talking about uh there's a great line uh where he asks frank to explain rap music and he this this old milton babbitt voice what is all this scratching of records (laughs) <laughs> like explain the scratching of records thing, and they're talking about Alex Rodriguez and like all kinds of fun stuff. He's like people hey, are so talking he's like he's the second coming of Joe DiMaggio. He's not the second coming of Dom DiMaggio. Like <laughs> it's just such a great little uh, glimpse into a brilliant composer's wonderful personality that you so uh, rarely get and really so rarely think of when you listen to his music so i would strongly encourage you to check out that that little series of videos and it's it's back when internet video was really early i think it was probably distributed via the real player uh if you can remember back to those days oh here's the uh by the way boom <laughs> Look at that. If you are only listening to the audio of this uh, episode, you are missing out because this is uh, this is what the internet looked like in the 90s, my children. Um, so, yes, looks much sharper today. I, I dig the new the new new music box. Look, guys, don't 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 change. Don't have a change. Um, I've made that joke twice today. I gotta oh, stop. I need to give a shout out. I need to give a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, Larry and Arlene. Done. Yay! They... Watching. That's yes. What we could have done to get a ton of people to log on. I've been like, yo, if you're, if you, on, I'll give you a shout out. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, why did I? Think? You, That's what you guys. Since you brought. Since I'm you so brought, bummed. Well. I missed them. Yeah, we talked to them on the show last week. They were our guests last week. Oh, really? They're delightful. I know, right? I have never, I do a lot of the social media stuff for Sound Notion. And so I'm constantly checking and sharing stuff on our Facebook page and checking Twitter and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, just constantly trying to increase network connectivity between people that you want to connect to. And I have met my foil in Arlene Dunn. She <laughs> is like doing it constantly. And like I'm looking, I'm checking her feed all the time now That's to see what's right happening. You know? Yeah, she, you, you have to work to keep up with them. On yeah, on Twitter gosh, and Facebook, yeah. Like I put in, uh, I put in a. They're suggest- all over it. I put in a suggested guest this morning, really quick, based on a uh, hashtag SN Weekly thing that uh, Irene, Eileen, uh, Arlene, Arlene, Arlene shared. I'm just kidding. <laughs> about, a new, about a new record label that sounds very interesting. Yes, I saw that. We should definitely talk to them. So yeah. the, I, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, yeah. We're kind of rambling now, but thank you all for putting up with our rambling. And more <laughs> importantly, uh, thank thank you to our guests, Sugar and Trevor, uh, for for spending some time with us this morning. Um, do you guys have anything uh, you want to plug? I know we've been talking yeah, about uh, a lot of stuff this morning, but uh, you, you the camera on me. Boom. Boom. Ah, it's coming out like weird. That's all right. Uh, our hashtag is if not now when and we've got a social media campaign um, happening next Thursday and we'll be tweeting about it So, and you could get um, you'll have a chance to win two tickets to potential energies yeah man the 29th right. at Dam Fisher That's, there you go remember that everybody Thursday May 29th at Bam Fisher 
hear these guys do potential energies for the very first time. We've been talking about it. Check out the trailer. Uh, mm. NouveauClassical.org, is that right? Yes. So definitely check out NouveauClassical.org. Uh, find them on Twitter. You guys are at, at NouveauClassical on Twitter? No, at NCP Music. Oh, sorry. I That's screwed okay. it up. At NCP Music. It was right in the in the picture. Um, so <laughs> at NCP Music, uh, so get get in touch with them there. Watch the trailer. Read all about them. Uh, you're you you definitely not going to be disappointed if you if you if you go see more about this stuff and go see the show uh, at the end of May. So uh, thanks again for for being here. Thank you to everyone who uh, joined us live and joined us in chat. Uh, it was lovely chatting with you all. Um, and it's it sounds like you you guys have some fans uh, in in the Sound Notion chat. So. Um, <laughs> yes, all 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 two of us are going strong. Um, if you would like to, if you're listening to this or watching this for the first time, and you want to uh, catch the show live next week, we we do stream the show live at 11 a.m. ish uh, every Sunday, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time, I should say, if you're in another part of the world. Um, so join us at live.soundnotion.tv for that, and you can join us in chat. And uh, if you have any questions for us or for our guests or any comments, and we'll, we'll pass all those along. Or if you want to contribute to this conversation and you're not watching live, that is wonderful. If you're listening or, or watching this after the fact, you can absolutely go to our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, and leave a comment on this post, or you can follow up with us on Twitter. We're at SoundNotion as a group on Twitter. I'm at Dave McDo. Sam is at Housegoy. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. And as we said earlier, uh, Nouveau Classical is at NCP Music. Sugar, uh, you are at Sugar Vendil. Is that right? Same. Same. My and name. Trevor is at T Gurekis. So um, that's uh, at T Gurekis, T G U R E C K I S, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so definitely you can, you can follow up with them on, on Twitter as well. We're also on Facebook, as are they. Um, you know, subscribe to us on YouTube, or you can subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes Store, Stitcher, wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by sharing it with your friends. You can, uh, you know what you should do? You should write a review for us in the iTunes Store. That would be wonderful. Um, that, that helps us kind of bubble up to the top when people are searching for things uh, in the iTunes store. So that, that's a great way to support us. You can also use the Amazon affiliate link on our site uh, so we get a commission when you buy your normal Amazon purchases. Um, so thank you so much for, for being with us again. Uh, thank you to Patrick for writing the music that you heard uh, introducing the show and to Tyler Lepp for creating the animation that you saw at the beginning of the show. That's going to do it for us this week. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you back next week.